My name's Josh Zepps. You may have heard me presenting ABC Radio Sydney or occasionally Late Night Live on Radio National. The more perceptive among you may have noticed that I am not, in fact, a woman. <laughs> not because uh, the people who organise this festival are labouring under the misapprehension that there are no women who would be able to do this, but because the All About Women Festival is really supposed to bring together speakers from all over the world to discuss issues that are important not just to women, but to men, and to people who don't fit in either binary. Tonight's guest would be fascinating, even if she were a non-woman, a non-binary, a non-human, and anybody. I want to hear what she has to say. This event was actually the second to sell out across the whole festival. It was beaten only by the gin-making workshop. <laughs> Tells you everything you need to know about Australians, doesn't it? <laughs> you want to go to a cultural festival? Is there gin? Yep, sign me up. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we're standing. Let's pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to all First Nations people who might be here today. There will be questions for Fran. I will excuse myself before the, the questions so that she can stand here and take them directly from you. Have a think during the interview about what questions you might wish to ask. Um, a handy hint, ideally, a question ends in a question mark <laughs> and is not preceded by your whole life story. <laughs> I know your life story is fascinating, but everyone else here wants to hear Fran rather than you. They also want to hear Fran rather than me. So without further ado, please welcome writer, cultural critic, loudmouth, editor at large without a publication, headliner of the festival, <laughs> Fran Leibowitz. Fran. Hi. Loud mouth. Loud mouth. <laughs> That's adorable. Thank you. Like my jacket. Uh, <laughs> almost as popular as gin. Yes. In Australia, that's saying something. I take your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, we, if we rewound the clock back to when you were growing up in New Jersey and we said that in 2018 you'd be on stage talking about your life and culture. What would you have thought back then that you would have done with your life? What did you want to do? It depends when you're talking about. Um, I mean, I wanted to be a writer. And I am. Yeah. So I was right. <laughs> <laughs> did you move to New York expressly with that vision? I did. When you were? 18. What was it like? Um, it, well, when it, it was, I might have been 19, I can never remember. Um, well, it was like 1970, so it was dangerous. Um, and people who are young now think it was cheap. <laughs> they said, you're kidding, that's what an apartment costs? But it, it was always the most expensive place to live in the United States. Um, and so it is still the most expensive place to live in the United States. Um, but it is uh, cleaner and it is duller. <laughs> Are those two things causally related? People think they are, but I know they're not. And people are always saying, would you like it better if it was dirty like it used to be and dangerous like it used to be? I said, no. But they, no, they're not related. They're absolutely not related. What everybody says about the 70s now um, is that New York was going bankrupt, which it apparently was. Um, I did not know that because I had no money. So, <laughs> and the bankruptcy of a city is of no interest to citizens of the city who are themselves bankrupt. You know, so I, I really had no idea. I thought it was just me who had no money. Um, the, the problem with what they did to um, repair that was that um, they decided that the way to make New York prosperous um, was by tourism. Um, and so, you know, like four men went into a room with a pencil and a pad. This is exactly what resulted in the Middle East, by the way. Um, so they were different four men, but they were four men, okay? <laughs> Um, and truthfully, if they, if they had, you know, switched places, if the four men who made up the Middle East had 
made up like New York's tourism, and the tourist people in New York had gotten the Middle East, same result. Um, <laughs> and so the thing is, New York is very unpopular in the United States. I mean, Americans hate New York. So the way to draw them to New York was to make a New York that they would like. You know, hence Times Square. Um, and so they made Times Square, which is where tourists like to go. Mm. And if I was in charge of New York, which I wasn't and I am not, um, I would stand at the border. I would solve two problems. The tourism problem in New York, which last year we had 58 million tourists in New York. 58 million. And they, I only know this because they brag about it. Um, I would stand at the border and I would say, okay, there were 58 million people here who were not citizens, residents of New York. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. We can take 58 million refugees. All right, clearly, there's room. Um, 58 million immigrants, um, and immigrants make the culture, and tourists ruin it. So I would stand at the border, <laughs> and I would say, you wanna come in? How long are you staying? That's all your luggage? No, go back. So that would solve all those problems. I also could solve the Middle East, but not now. Do we wanna hear the plan to solve the Middle East? I it's very similar. <laughs> you get everyone from the Midwest to go to the Mideast. That's right. And, and let the people from the Middle East go to the Midwest, mm -hmm. where when people are that bored, they don't fight them. <laughs> <laughs> Omaha would be a very different place, wouldn't it? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure that there are 58 million hotel rooms at the Four Seasons, but I guess you'd well, find... Not everybody stays different. at the Four Seasons. Okay. Okay. Um, so that... Uh, that, well, the fact that we accommodate, even before Airbnb, a hideous invention, um, <clears throat> uh, every time you build a hotel, you're building it in a place where there should be an apartment building. And that is another reason why real estate is so expensive in New York. One of the themes of, of this festival and of this event is nostalgia and cultural nostalgia. And I feel like New York, at the time that you moved there, is the kind of place that people feel nostalgic for, even if they've never been to New York, because it's got, it's so sort of iconic. Warhol and the, the music of the 70s and Taxi Driver and all that. Um, did, did you have a sense at the time that it was something that was gonna foster that kind of sentiment? Did it feel like you were part of something bigger than yourself? Um, no, I've never felt there was anything bigger than myself, but... Um, <laughs> uh, no, but it is true. In other words, New York in the 70s um, is something of interest to, to everyone. I did not think about that. And at first it startled me. In other words, kids frequently come up to me and talk to me and they say, oh, I wish I'd lived in New York in the 70s. And you know, I know that when I was young, I didn't come up to people and say, oh, I wish I lived in New York in the 40s. You know, I mean, <laughs> so that like for young people to want to have lived in a previous era is unusual, I think. You know, I mean, uh, to have nostalgia for something you didn't live through is almost the same thing as having nostalgia for something you did live through, you know, because both are wrong. Um, but <clears throat> it is, I think it's gonna remain that way, the way that like Paris in the 20s seems very romantic to people. Um, and uh, why that is, I'm not certain, um, but it, it does absolutely seem the case that it's not gonna change. There's, a, there's a, a, a concept in, I think it's Japanese, which is like a sense that you will in the future feel nostalgic about the thing that you're experiencing in the present, which I think is quite nice. Like you sometimes have those wistful moments if, you're, if there's a moment of great tenderness or love or you're on vacation or something, and you're like, wow, in 40 years' time, I'm going to look back on this and think this is incredible and wish I was here. Is that an experience that you have? No. <laughs> <laughs> One day at a time. No. <laughs> I mean, you were on, I, I, was, I was Googling around some of your old videos and you were on David Letterman uh, 35 years ago. Crack and wisecracks and he's, he's... He looked better, right, without that beard? <laughs> certainly looked better without the beard, although the gap in the teeth was always there. Um, what did you make of that? Of Letterman? Yeah, and, and of becoming, uh, of being a young person who had such cultural cachet that they were able to be on Letterman. Um, I don't know. I didn't think about it. I mean, I, I liked being on television a lot because it made me feel more American. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, especially at that time, and even it's still the case, that, you know, Americans don't really think New York is America, and New Yorkers know it's not. Um, so that, uh, but being on television it was the most American thing you could do. Um, and, you know, that TV show it was all over the country. Um, and so that it prepared Americans more for me. In your first book, uh, Metropolitan Life, you wrote 
the following. Quote, very few people possess true artistic ability. It's therefore both unseemly and unproductive to irritate the situation by making an effort. <laughs> if you have a burning, restless urge to write or paint, simply eat something sweet and the feeling will pass. <laughs> See, no one ever listens to me. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm accused of being a bad influence, and I'm shocked because I'm not an influence at all. I'm constantly telling people what to do, they never do it. This was in 1978. I mean, this was... Uh, I, I feel like if you could fast forward to, to, to today, where everybody is curating their lives in real time on Instagram, uh, it would seem prescient. Yes, what do you mean, would? <laughs> That's what prescient means. <laughs> Has it gotten... <laughs> has it gotten worse? Has what gotten worse? The sense that everybody thinks that they possess artistic ability and that their well, lives are worth Well, of course it's gotten worse telling. because now they have the means to disseminate this. I mean, before that, you know, people you know, weren't able to instantly transmit their, you know, hopes, dreams and ambitions to everyone else. Mm. Um, now they do. So this used to be, you know, a more confined thing. Yeah. Um, also, it, it didn't used to be, writing, for instance, um, didn't used to be a profession in the way that it is now. I mean, there, for instance, there weren't, there, I don't know about here, but in the United States, there are all these uh, writing schools, graduate programs in writing. Um, a, they cost about $60,000 a year. And B, you cannot teach people how to write. So I don't, you know, I don't understand. There was one when I was young. There was University of Iowa Writers Workshop. There may have been one or two others, but there are now just dozens and dozens of these things. And so it's become, it's also it was not a thing that most people's parents would want them to do, you know, to be a writer. Um, and now they do because that's who pays for these graduate schools. Um, so now it's kind of like being a dentist. You know, people think you can go to school and then you can become a writer. And they're, in a way, they're kind of right. Um, however, it's not true. Um, and, you know, I have friends who teach in these writing schools because a lot of writers have to teach because it's not like being a dentist. You don't make that much money. Um, and I always say, what do you teach them? And they always say, I teach them how to read. And I think, well, then you should call it, you know, a reading degree. Um, and the reason you can't teach people how to write is because it is a talent. And you cannot teach people how to have a talent. So that talent is probably the most democratic thing there is in the world because it is absolutely randomly scattered among the population. You know, it's not a thing that's genetic. It's not a thing you can buy. It's not a thing you can teach. Um, so, you know, there are many people who go to these writing schools who have careers. Um, but a career is not the same thing as an ability to write. Do you think it's more legit to want to be a writer now than it was in the 70s? I don't know what you mean by legit. I mean, it, it is more of a profession now. And these writing schools do feed into things. They write, they get published, they put a story in the New Yorker, then they get mm. a book contract, and then they review each other's books. And I mean, I did once say to people, who reads? I mean, I buy these books sometimes thinking, I love to read, you know, and I love novels, and I, I, I buy these books, and I think, like, who reads these books? And I, they do. Mm. I mean, the reason... <laughs> The reason I ask about legit is because what you're saying is sort of um, runs counter to a criticism that I hear a lot about education these days, which is that it's purely vocational, that everyone's being encouraged to go into STEM, that it's not artistic enough, that the idea of a liberal arts education is, is dying, and that actually what we need more of is encouraging people to become things like writers. But it isn't a question of a liberal arts education, it isn't so that you become a writer, it's so that you read books written by writers. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a mobile phone, is that true? That is true. I do not have a uh, mobile phone. Is that a conscious decision? Um, well, kind of conscious. I mean, not as conscious as it looks, because people now, you know, of course, accuse me of being a Luddite. Um, that is partially because they don't know what a Luddite was. But um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have a computer. I don't have an iPhone, I don't have an iPad, I don't have a microwave oven. If you told me that I could text you on my microwave oven, I would believe you. Um, <laughs> but the reason for this is not a, a, an aversion to technology, it's an antipathy toward machinery, period. I never had a typewriter. So I don't know how to type, and you have to type on these things. Um, and when they first invented the sort of computer you would have in your house, it was called a word processor. And a friend of mine got one, a friend of mine who's a screenwriter, and said, you have to, this is fantastic, you have to come see this. And I went and I looked at it and I thought, this is just a very fast typewriter. You know, I don't know how to type and I don't need anything this fast. I mean, 
I write so slowly, I could write my own blood without hurting myself. <laughs> so, so I, now, I did not know that the whole world would go into these machines. You know, perhaps if I knew that, I might have made some effort to learn how to do it, but I didn't know that. And um, as far as having like a phone, you know, a cell phone that you walk around with all the time, when they did invent those things, I absolutely did not want one. And, you know, especially because people say, but I can't reach you. I said, that is the point of not <laughs> having it. Um, and what, one of the things that surprised, I mean, the invention of these things, you know, is of course quite surprising. They're quite kind of miraculous. Um, but the thing that surprised me the most is that people, mostly or largely have given up talking on the phone um, instead to text. Mm. I find this breathtaking. It is so much easier to talk on the phone. You just said you don't want people calling you. Nor do we. But people text each other. You know, I know you can read them when you want, supposedly, although that can't be true since everyone's always on them. Um, (laughs) But the idea that people, if they... To me, this seems like technology going backwards. If first they invented texting, then they invented the telephone, people said, it's incredible, you don't have to write, you just pick it up, and (laughs) you only make your plans once. You You don't keep changing them because they can keep finding you. Um, So that um, even if I suddenly knew how to work things, which I don't, I would never text, because the idea that I would spend my entire life writing for free is out of the question. (laughs) I mean, the funny thing about smartphones is you say you don't want people calling you, but actually the vast majority of what people who have smartphones do on their phones is not talking to people. I mean, what proportion would you say of the amount of time that you spend on your smartphone is actually people calling you or you calling other people? Like 10%, 5%? 2%. Right, but when they first invented cell phones, you could not text on them. They oh. were for talking. No, I understand. I understand. So, but I'm no, just... No, I now, people don't... That's what I just said. They don't like to talk on the phone. They'd rather text on the phone. Yeah. You know, I would rather read. Some people are reading oh. on their phones. Yeah, not books. Not I mean, books. I, I know that you can... You know, I, I read the subway, okay? Um, the New York City subway system used to be a wash in newsprint. In fact, the streets were. They were ankle deep in newspapers. That's all you saw, newsprint all over the place. Um, now, everyone has one of these. There's some aspect of um, this, whatever you call it, this um, transmission that doesn't work on the subway. Mm. Um, but some of it does. So I sit on the subway and I look at people, they're on their phones, and 90% of them, adults, are playing games. Okay, adults, not little children, mm. adults playing games on their phone. Do you think this can be a good thing for America? <laughs> okay, I mean, I was on a plane next to a guy going from, I think, Dallas to New York or something, and he was a very nice person to sit next to, by which I mean he didn't talk, but <laughs> he was on his phone and he was right next to me and he, played, he was an adult, okay? Um, and he had a job, you know, important enough that someone paid for his first class seat, not me. And he was playing a game on his phone. And so afterward, I said to someone, they said, well, what was the game? I said, I don't know. It seemed like he was killing fruit. I looked at it. You know, there were a few of those. <laughs> um, and I thought, this occupied him for like four hours. Mm. Um, so I don't think, you think it's a good thing? No, I mean, this is, part, this is partly why I was interested in why you don't have a mobile phone, because I thought that there might be some conscious conceit behind, behind it, in the sense that there, we, we never have moments in our lives at the moment where we are bored, where we just have to fill time. I mean, I remember when they introduced the, uh, the, the ability to use your cell phone on the subway, and it changed everything, because people at least used to have to either read or gaze vacantly into middle You can't talk look on the people. subway. Uh, you can't get a, a, re- a reception on the subway. But you can use it... No, it's at a lot of stations now you can. Um, not, not on here. a train. Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, here. yeah. I don't live here. Um, <laughs> I hope this doesn't come to New York. Uh, th- no, I mean, the cell phone companies have offered... Uh, this is my favorite thing. We offer New York City for free. We will, you know, do whatever you have to do to enable... And New Yorkers say, no, we don't want this. Because what would make the subways worse? People yelling under mm, the phone. Mm. So, you know, th- so far we don't have that. Well, now they're thinking about trialing it on planes. Can you imagine? No. No. Uh, you mean so you could talk? On yeah, so you could actually talk on your cell phone um, on the plane and it would use an internal system on the plane to um, re- I, You know, broadcast. within two seconds, there would be, like, you know, a murder on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I just wonder whether or not it does something to people's sense of creativity to... I mean, if, so I'm asking this specifically because a friend of mine just recently intentionally got rid of his mobile phone. And we'd made plans. You just said a moment ago, you, made, you make plans once and then you don't change them constantly. So I thought to myself, well, what would I do if I were running late? See, and I thought I'm I just never late. I would just have to not ever... You be late. late. <laughs> what a... Yeah, it's, all right. it's a revelation. I, I am the... I, certainly, I'm the most reliable person in New York. Now, admittedly, this is not a rough field. But sometimes I'll be in a restaurant and someone who works in a restaurant will come over and say, um, so-and-so just called, they're really sorry, but they're running late. And I said, I already know that. And he said... <laughs> and the person will say, how? And I say, because they're not here. However, it is not acceptable to do that. I do not accept it. Okay, it's as simple as that. People, it, how hard could it be? You know, I mean, you have a plan to meet at nine o'clock, mm. be there at nine o'clock. Who are you that you think you could change that plan? <laughs> All right? I mean, this is not connected, but on my way here um, from LA to Melbourne, which is where I was going, which as you know is a 12,000 hour flight. Um, <laughs> When we finally got there, I noticed that we were, they don't call it circling anymore, but whatever they call it, I noticed we were circling. I noticed this because I've been looking at my watch for 16 hours, um, basically thinking, when can I smoke? You know, um, and then there was an announcement from the pilot uh, saying that we were not gonna be landing right away um, because the uh, air traffic control or something did not sequence the landings properly, and the pilot was very annoyed. Like, usually, one of the things that annoys me about pilots is that they're not annoyed, you know? <laughs> is that they say, well, we're very sorry, but just relax, we hope you enjoy... No, land the plane, okay? Um, and he, the pilot got on the, on the intercom and said, as if this flight wasn't already long enough. <laughs> <laughs> they are not letting us land yet. Um, well, I guess you weren't flying Qantas. <laughs> oh, and I thought to myself, this guy smokes. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> <laughs> this guy wants to get off this plane. Um, <clears throat> and then I thought to myself, how is it possible we can't land? It's not like we're just dropping by. I mean, we left 20 hours ago. <laughs> Did they not call and say, in 20 hours, get ready, we're gonna be there. <laughs> so they have all this technology, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um. <laughs> You're fairly scathing about uh, conformism in your writing. You, you write um, that in extreme, except in extremely rare instances, people are pretty much like everyone else. They all say the same things, have the same names, and wear their hair in the same styles. Is that any better or worse today than it used to be? No, it's always the same. It's human nature. Human nature is not that great. That's why they call it human nature and not human heart. <laughs> No, people are, I mean, people feel that they're very different from each other, you know, because it makes people feel, I don't know, I suppose, less despairing, you know, but people are in many ways alike, which is why you can predict the behavior of people very frequently, which is why adults very often know what children are doing. It's not just your own history of having been a child, it's because even though I know your own child is, of course, very special, um, <laughs> <laughs> Most people could say, children will do this, you know, um, and so will adults. So I know that there are some people who are distinctive, um, but that's what distinctive means. There are not that many of them. Mm. Has it been part of a, one of your goals to be one of those people? I never thought about it. I never really thought about it. You never it. thought about being distinctive, Fran? No, I never thought, I don't think about other people that much. <laughs> All right? So in other words, first you have to compare yourself to other people. All right, which I don't do that much, okay? So that um, I, I never really, no, I never, I never thought about it in that way. That is true. Mm. I know you don't believe me, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of thing that only a distinctive person would say. <laughs> um, some of your writing, one of the loveliest things about your writing is how politically incorrect it, it, can, it can feel. Um, there's, a, there's a piece in your first book in which you talk about how much you hate dogs 
which to begin with is a controversial statement for a lot of people. And then you say that when you say that dogs should be banned from New York, a lot of people say, well, what about people who are lonely without dogs? Or what about blind people? And you say the solution is we should get rid of dogs and make the lonely people lead the blind people around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a perfect solution. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I mean, I wrote that probably like 40 years ago or yeah. 30 years ago. And of course, it's much worse now because <clears throat> people's attitude towards animals is much more crazy than it was then. I mean, a billion times. I would never have predicted it. So that, for instance, I mean, there probably were always people that like, push their dogs around in like a baby carriage inside their house, you know, but they didn't do it in public because of course it's mortifying, you know. Um, there, there maybe were people who always put like coats on their dogs, you know, I mean like little garments, yeah. um, but they did it in the privacy of their own home <laughs> because they were ashamed of it <laughs> and they were right. And the idea of dogs wearing clothes, what do they think fur is? <laughs> I mean, the, the dog comes clothed. <laughs> you don't have to clothe the dog. Please don't. Um, and also there's so many, the people have more dogs than they used to have, mm. and they can go in more places. They can, dogs can come on planes now. Well, especially in the States, it's crazy. It's I mean, crazy. the plane is half full of dogs these days. Yes. And you can bring the dog on the plane if it's something called an emotional support animal, okay? And they have to wear this like little vest um, and it says E-S-A on it. Um, and adults, here's what they're doing. They're saying, I am something so wrong with me <laughs> that I cannot get on a plane without my dog. <laughs> so since it's very clear what this is, why bother with a live dog? I mean, children have teddy bears. That's what that is, okay? I personally would provide a teddy bear to every person in the United States who wants to bring a dog on a plane, I'm on. Mm. Leave the dog home, here's a teddy bear. <laughs> and you know how you get those little vests that say emotional support animal? You go to a website and you pay $14.99 and they send them to you. It, like, it's honestly, you don't, there's no more than that. You just have to get it and then you dress your dog up in the stupid little outfit and you can bring him on a plane. I mean, it's a really shocking idea, I have to tell you. And um, uh, the governor of New York, um, Andrew Cuomo, who some people, but not me, think should be president, um, he made a law that you can bring a dog into a restaurant that has an outside part of the restaurant, like an outside cafe. The dog can sit in that outside cafe. Isn't that disgusting? <laughs> Just watching you eat. It's, no, that I have to watch a dog while I'm eating. Yeah. I think that's disgusting. Why shouldn't the governor of New York be president? Well, I'm not saying in general the governor of New York should not be the president. This one, this one should not be the president because he's a thug, okay? I know he's a Democrat, and yes, he would be better than Donald Trump, but that can't be the standard, okay? So, I mean, his, also his father was the governor of New York, um, and I am uh, constitutionally opposed to dynasties, you know? Uh, so that is why we had that little war with England. <laughs> In terms of political correctness, do you, do you have any sense that, um, that people are easier to upset now than they used to be? Not being on social media, it's possible that you don't have to experience that firsthand. But Twitter is just a vast cluster F of people getting angry about the most irrelevant things. And I wonder whether or not social media has sort of facilitated that in a way that makes it, I don't know, people less likely to say controversial stuff. Well, as you said, I'm not on it, but I'm aware of it, I hear about it. Um, Yes, people are overly sensitive, there's no question, but also people cherish these things in themselves. In other words, their ability to be easily offended is something they quite cherish because they believe you know, that it's a kind of morality, you know, but it is not. Okay, emotion is not morality. You know, morality is you have to do something, okay? And just being offended is insufficient. Yes, it's better than Donald Trump, but it's not enough, <laughs> okay? So I know also in colleges in the United States, they, they, um, they stop people from coming to speak if they don't agree with them, and um, the idea that that's a left position is shocking to me, you know? Yes, of course, I would prefer not to hear a Nazi speak, so if I was in college and a Nazi came to speak in college, I wouldn't go. 
But I would know how important it is. It is incredibly important to let him speak. Especially the more you would hear someone like that speak, the less powerful they would be. Because you know, these people, you know, are idiots. You know, I mean, if you actually hear this stuff, and especially the people who believe in it, if they really listen to it, perhaps they would not believe in it. Mm. And sometimes it's not even Nazis. Sometimes it's just people who are using the fact that they know that they're going to get a rise out of people for publicity. Milo Yiannopoulos and these kinds of people who go around the campuses, say provocative things, know that people are going to, going to riot, and that's what gets them the very notoriety that gets them the invitation to the next campus. Yes, well, that's someone who wants to be too distinctive, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, does that have any relevance to the, to the movement that we're, that we're in regarding sexual harassment? I know that you know a lot of the big fish, the men who have been brought down by this, swimming in the cultural circles that you do, and we're reaching a sort of point at which I feel it's potential, there's a potential for a, a mild backlash, and I wonder... But this is a wish of men, okay? It's not I my mean, wish. Yes, this is... Well, everyone who brings this up to me is a man. So, <clears throat> this is a wish... Jermaine Greer is not a man. I'm sorry? Jermaine Greer is not a man. Um, Catherine Deneuve's not a man. Catherine Deneuve is French. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I didn't know Germaine Greer said this, but um, I believe that she did. Uh, do I think there's going to be a backlash? I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Do I think that you know, men are, would prefer this wasn't happening? Yes, I do. I do think that they would prefer this wasn't happening. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Um, when people say, like, well, there's a difference between this and this, and, you know... Um, I, I suppose that is true to some extent. Um, there is already a backlash, just the fact that these men said this and also Jermaine Greer. But um, if you're asking me if I think that's a legitimate position, no, I do not. Um, and I also think that this is not the kind of thing that you can explain to a man. You cannot. You know, you just can't explain it because it's not a thing. It's not just these incidents, these episodes, these things that happen to people, this thing happened to this woman because this man did this. It is the very world you live in from the time you're like 13, if you're a girl, so that you cannot describe this to a man, okay? Now, I mean, do I think that's gonna change? You know, somewhat, you know, but it's gonna change in these kind of segmented ways, like you can maybe get this job you couldn't get before, a man can't act this way on the job, but the world, is not gonna change completely because it's biological. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like, I mean, people say things like, do you think there ever be, you know, feminism will really be successful? You know, not if you mean total equality, I don't. You know, do I think it should be? Of course, I would love it to be. Um, do I think it's gonna end? I do not. You know, the way that, for instance, racism could end, it's not going to because of human nature. But racism could end because it's a total fantasy. You know, racism is just a fantasy of uh, superiority. There literally is no difference between people of different races. Zero difference. It's like saying, you know, we are different species because your jacket is plaid and mine is striped. It's meaningless. But there are real differences between men and women. So if you tell me, oh, well, but what about the time where men will get pregnant by accident? Then it'll be equal. <laughs> but before that happens, it will not. So, you know, to me, as, as good as it can become, that's how I would like it to become, you know. And, um, I, you know, as far as these guys who got caught, you know, I was flabbergasted. It never occurred to me that would stop, ever, ever. I mean, it was one of the most surprising things of my life. And then to see one after another, it was so enjoyable. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, at, I mean, at the very least, those particular guys, they're finished. I know they don't think that. You know, I'm sure many of them, you know, are plotting. To... I think Harvey's got an idea. I doubt it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of them think they're gonna get back in in some way. Um, those particular people, I don't think will. Um, it's not that I think there'll be a lesson to anyone, you know, but I think it's just good to get these particular people out. Additionally, you know, especially at the height of this, when there was like one every three days, you know, there are all these fantastic jobs open. You know, these are some of the best jobs in the country. You know, I mean, if you actually gave all these jobs to women, this would stop. You'd have some bad bosses. You know, women can be bad bosses, but you don't have this. You know, this is particularly butch. 
I didn't want to ask you about uh, about the orange genius in the White House at the moment uh, because I, I have a sneaking suspicion that during the Q&A, which we're going to get to in just a moment, someone maybe might ask a question about Trump, just potentially. But um, just broadly about whether or not you're optimistic and pessimistic about the moment that we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in a weird moment politically with Trump and with Brexit in the UK and with the rise of right-wing populist parties here and in Western Europe. And... Yet at the same time, there are all kinds of cultural movements that should give us heart, like the one you were just talking about. Where do you think we're at? Well, I would rather it was the other way around. In other words, I would r rather that these movements we're talking about were people who are actually in power. The reason you have to have a movement is because you're out of power. So, you know, the reason you have to have a protest movement is you're protesting people who are in power. So if you would ask me, I would rather that I was the president and Donald Trump was sitting here telling you what he thinks, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but that's not gonna happen. I mean, um, I think it's more than a weird moment to have Donald Trump be the president. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, and I also think, although these, these things aren't connected, I agree with you. Brexit, you know, these right-wing movements in Eastern Europe, they are connected, you know, um, but none of them are as bad as Donald Trump being the president. None, because they're more regional, you know, they're more containable. You know, when uh, Trump was elected, a friend of mine who was Italian said, well, oh, it'll be all right, you know, we had Berlusconi. And I said, yes, and that was terrible for the Italians. <coughs> I'm sorry, but the president of the United States is, affects the whole world. So it's horrible for the whole world. You know, you don't have to think about it as much as we do because we think about him 24 hours a day. Mm. And that has never happened. I mean, there have been a lot of presidents that are horrible in my lifetime. And we had eight years of George Bush. You know, I mean, I never thought it could be worse than that. But we didn't think about George Bush 24 hours a day. Mm. You know, so that in um, societies where people think about the leader or the president 24 hours a day, those are dictatorships. Mm. You know, those, you know, that's where there's like the big man, you know, and you have to think about him. In North Korea, they think about uh, Kim Jong-il, whatever his name is, they think about him 24 hours a day, okay? And so I never expected that to be happening, you know, in the West Village. <laughs> you know, and now it does. So that, uh, I mean, another thing about planes and devices, you're on a plane, you don't, people aren't getting that stuff because you can't get that stuff on a plane, I guess. And then you get off the plane, and the guy who's standing behind you turns on his phone and goes, oh my God. And then the guy sitting next to you goes, what do you do now? And this is what brings us together. <laughs> I did hear someone say that a, a decent definition of freedom is not having to think, of, is, is realizing that a week has gone by without thinking about your leader. That's right, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah, and, okay, and that doesn't happen anymore. And that doesn't happen here either as well. I mean, it, it, just in terms of Trump. The amount of kind of emotional and intellectual bandwidth that's getting sucked up by that guy is, sometimes it makes me wonder whether or not we're partly at fault for this as well. We're not. Whether we, we're <laughs> and we're whether, not. Whether no, wait, we this is one of the of... simplest things. We know whose fault this is. His. Okay, I mean, it's very, like, I am you a fault finder. I am telling you, I have found the fault. It's him. <laughs> it is not me, it is not you, neither of us voted for him, okay? Um, so it, I, we know who it was, it's the people who voted for him, they are at fault, it's the Russians, they are at fault, it's James Comey, he is at fault. I have, we have actual lists of the people we know who they are. <laughs> we have their names. Couldn't the media tell us a nice story about some far off galaxy where some stars are doing something funky once in a while instead of always reporting on the bad stuff though? Well, I mean, there, I mean, when, uh, it's, it's partially, I wouldn't say the fault of the media, but the amount of coverage they gave him, you know, which he chortled about, you know, I got a billion dollars with the free you know, coverage, you know, um, because the ratings went up, because people, you know, it's like watching a car crash, you know, people look, you know, people were riveted by this. I mean, it's why, like what Les Moonves said, who's the um, chairman of uh, CBS. Mm. He said, it may be bad for America, but it's great for CBS. Um, as if, uh, it's so interesting to me that Les thought these are two separate things, um, you know, so that, yes, it's like, you know, a great television, you know? I would much rather, of course, have like a sane, intelligent, dull president. You know, he's too exciting. Who would your pick be? I'm sorry? Who would your pick for Anyone. a dull president be? <laughs> Anyone, I'm telling you, I, did, I take the subway, I sit in the subway, if I'm not getting off, I say to myself, when the doors open, the next person who gets on this train would be a better president than Donald Trump. <laughs> 
<laughs> and that is true, even if that person's in a stroller. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Fran Leibowitz, please make her very welcome. Thank you. I'm going to unleash uh, Fran on you, uh, on your, on, on your good selves. Uh, if you, uh, there is a, a new show on Radio National that I want to give a plug for that we'll be doing that starts in five weeks' time, which is called Citizen Jury. It'll be on on Saturday nights at five thirty for an hour. It will be hosted by me. Once again, please thank Fran Leibowitz. Thank you. I'm going to answer questions from the audience in an entertaining fashion. <laughs> you don't have to ask them in an entertaining fashion. Just raise your hand. I will call upon you. If people don't hear the question, I'll repeat it. You don't have to stand up. Yes. Yes, you. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry. Oh. Uh, she said, I said women can be bad bosses. Would I clarify that, what I meant by that uh, compared to men? Well, I mean, women can be bad bosses. They can be overly demanding. They can be mean. You know, women have a lot of bad, women can have the same bad traits men have, um, except without the testosterone is what I meant. Um, I meant so you're not going to have, you know, a bad woman boss who's raping her assistant. That's what I meant. Um, so that, you know, that may seem like a fine line to you. Um, <laughs> but not to me. So, um, you know, there are not, you know, I don't know out here, but there are not that many women bosses, period. There are not enough women bosses, period, in any field. Um, and so I was saying that some will be good, some will be bad. You know, women aren't better people than men in that way, so you might have some bad bosses. You know, but you wouldn't have this stuff. You know, uh, it just wouldn't happen. And so that would be enough reason, in my opinion, to have all women bosses. <laughs> yes. Yes. More what than ever? Divided. Oh, she said it seems like America is more divided than ever. Um, do I have a solution for this? Um, you're right, and yes, I do. Um, <laughs> America is more divided than ever, and do I have a solution for this? I do. Um, America is divided. If you look um, on election night, or I'm sure you can find this on your phone, um, if you look on election night, uh, when they're showing you the, um, how the, the states voted, um, and for some reason they picked red for uh, Republicans and blue for Democrats, and you look at the end of the night, and you look and see where the Republicans won, what you will see is what used to be called the Confederacy. Okay, that is who votes for Republicans. Uh, okay, so when I look at these maps, like when George Bush wins and then George Bush wins, you know, and then Donald Trump wins, and people say whose fault it is, I look at these maps and I think, this is Abraham Lincoln's fault. <laughs> and that is because he should have let them go. Okay? <laughs> the country is divided. I mean, there's numerous ways in which the country is divided. You know, there are economic differences, there's all these differences, but at the center of this is racism, pure and simple, that's what this is. It's not complicated. You know, I mean, the Republicans are always making, you know, complicated things seem easy and simple things seem complicated. So that, you know, someone walks into a school with a machine gun and kills 17 people and they say, this is about mental health. All right, so mental health is very complicated, as I'm sure you know. People are not even sure of their own mental health from hour to hour. So the idea that we're gonna put this in the hands of the government because this is what's causing this, no, guns, that's too simple. What causes someone to die of a bullet is a gun. I mean, what could be more simple? Okay, but that's, they don't want that answer. So they make a complicated answer. I mean, one of the millions of shootings we've had like in the last year was in a church in Texas. Did I press something wrong? Oh. Um, there was a man walked into a little church in someplace in Texas, um, 
and shot many people. I can't remember how many because we have these shootings every five minutes. Um, the reason he did this, by the way, was he thought his mother-in-law might be there. Not, not even his mother-in-law, his ex-mother-in-law um, might be there, and she was, in fact, not there. Um, and the response in Texas to this tragedy was this church was a little wooden church 100 years old, and the response to this um, tragedy was they're going to tear down the church because guns don't kill people, churches kill people. Um, in this high school in Florida, they're gonna tear down the building where the shooting happened. What does this have to do with construction? It has nothing to do with it. It is, so, I mean, a two-year-old could tell you if you shoot a gun and a bullet is in the gun and it hits someone, they're gonna die. So that's what causes it. Um, and so that is why the country is divided because half the country thinks that it's not the gun, you know, that it's the church um, or it's, you know, the mental health or, and the other half of the country knows it's the gun. And we know exactly which part of the country this is. So that, you know, if Abraham Lincoln hadn't, you know, been an overachiever, um, <laughs> they would have their own country and we would have a real country. You know, I mean, these southern states um, are the poorest states. If you look at a list of the countries, of the states in the United States, the poorest, you know, the 10 poorest states will be the 10 southern states. And it, it never occurs to them to ask why. Why are these the poorest states? I mean, how long will it take you to figure out how to make money without slaves? You know, I mean, Come on, you gotta get moving. Um, <laughs> how long will it take you to realize, you know, it'd be a very good idea if you would provide for the people in your states public schools. That would be good. Um, healthcare, that would be good. I mean, it's not complicated, you know, um, but they refuse to do it, and so we have the situation we have now. That's what the Electoral College is for. Every time a Republican wins by losing the popular vote and winning the Electoral College, people who are young say, why don't they stop having electoral college? It doesn't work. And I say, A, they'll never stop having it because you need a constitutional amendment, and B, it works perfectly. It does exactly, that's what it was meant to do. The reason for the electoral college is to overweight the Southern vote, and it does. And so I hope that answered your question, and I hope you're cheered up by that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. She said, she said she's 50 years old and that women of her age, um, I am much older than 50 years old, um, that women of her age were led to believe they could have it all and she found out they couldn't. Um, why would you believe such a thing? Um, <laughs> and, and what would be my advice to young women? Um, it, she, it turns out that women cannot have it all. Um, the only um, solace for that is that, you know, really almost no one can. Um, but the particular things that women thought they could have, together, you can't, okay? Here's what you can't have. You cannot have some sort of, um, I don't know, um, very fulfilling kind of 1950s family life and be on the Supreme Court. Cannot do it. The, to, in order to have a very big career, the chances that you have a very fantastic personal life, if you're a woman, very small. And this is because Men get to have such a small amount of responsibility for domestic life compared to women. Now, I know that in individual you know, cases, people have worked it out better, but it's the kind of thing men never have to work out. Okay, women have to work that out. Um, on the other hand, you could not get married, you could not have children. By the way, not having children is a fantastic idea. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in every way, and yet, the culture's going the opposite way. So instead of like rewarding someone like me, you know, who didn't have children, you know, with say some pollution credits, <laughs> you know, like, friend, you had no children. So while you're on that 22 hour flight, light up. <laughs> because you don't have a carbon footprint, friend. 
you have a carbon fingerprint. <laughs> so there's that, you know. Um, instead of that, they've invented ways to have babies that are unbelievable. You're 70, you wanna have a baby, we can do it. <laughs> you know, you're two men, you wanna have a baby, we can do it. You know, you are, I mean, there's all kinds, as if there was some sort of shortage of people in the world. I mean, there are too many people in the world, not too few. If there were too few, do you think people would complain about traffic? There are too many people in the world. All right, so if you have chosen, or by happenstance, not to have children, congratulations, thank you. <laughs> if you are dying to raise a child, there are many abandoned children all over the world. Adopt some of these children. <laughs> then you wouldn't have to dress that dog up, you know, in a little sweater. <laughs> so. Yes? Um, I've heard once that you, you had an aspiration or a dream to be a Supreme Court judge and sort of, you know, as a fantasy. Um, I'm wondering if you had achieved that position and you were to sentence Donald Trump to the majority of the American people, what kind of sentence would you... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the question was that he read that somewhere that I had an aspiration to be a Supreme Court judge. That is true. I have not given that up, okay? <laughs> You know, he said it was a fantasy. It's a dream. It is a dream. Um, it is a burning, restless urge. Um, and I think that even for people who don't like me, which I know is most people, I think that people would have to agree that I would be an excellent Supreme Court judge because I am very judgmental. <laughs> and I make snap judgments. So, like, it wouldn't take me long. Like, I'd be the most productive person ever on the Supreme Court. Because the, the, uh, the questions before the Supreme Court are questions of constitutionality. They're very simple. I, I never understand why it takes them long. Uh-huh, yes, no, yes, no. You can't do this, yes, you can't do that. I mean, it's really simple. Um, so, but, but what the Supreme Court does not do is sentence people. Because the question was, what would I sentence Donald Trump to? Um, the people, uh, the Supreme Court um, is not that type of court. They do not sentence people. It is, of course, my dream <laughs> that Donald Trump would go before an actual court that sentences people. Um, it is my dream, for instance, to one day see a New York City cop put his hand on top of that orange head and put him in the back of a cop car, you know? <laughs> Um, but I am not expecting that to occur. Um, although I am, I'm not sure expecting is the right word because that's uh, more uh, confident than you know, I actually feel. Um, I believe there is a significant chance that Donald Trump will not finish this term. Um, <clears throat> I do not think he will be impeached. He certainly won't be impeached by this Congress. Um, but I think that if the investigation gets close enough to the thing he's really afraid of, which is they find out why he was in no collusion with the Russians, which is, they're, you know, it's money, it's about money. Donald Trump only cares about money. Donald Trump has no ideology, he's not a Republican, he's not a Democrat, he's not even a Nazi. Um, he doesn't have the fortitude, you know? <laughs> I mean, he cares only about that, and he cares only about himself. You know, I, someone told me, I w I've been here since last Monday, I don't mean here, but in, in Australia, and a friend of mine told me on the phone from New York, oh, you know, um, they're gonna get close to Jared, they're, he lost his security clearance, and you know, Donald Trump, he's gonna be upset about that. He doesn't care about Jared. He doesn't care about Ivanka. He doesn't care about anyone but Donald Trump. That's what a narcissist is. He really doesn't care about anyone else. And so, I mean, really doesn't care about anyone else. So. <clears throat> You know, I would like to see, you know, him get so panicked, you know, uh, and, you know, that he would say, he would say something like, you know, this is ridiculous. I had a much better life. You know, people are driving me crazy. I'm going back to that giant piece of junk I built on Fifth Avenue and have a wonderful life. And I would say, you know what? Go. <laughs> you know, um, I, that could happen. You know, it might not. Yes. Uh, everyone says this. He said, but then we get Pence. Okay, here's the thing about Pence. Unlike Donald Trump, Pence has a real ideology. Pence has a record, okay, and Pence has an ideology. Pence is a right-wing Christian nut, okay? He believes in these things. Not enough of the country 
believes in them, he could never get elected. I mean, really what Pence really cares about is abortion. You know, that is what these people are obsessed with. Um, and so when you hear them talking about this and you see, you know, the things that they, well, not right is probably not the right word, but, you know, the material, you know, the, the product of their so-called minds, um, <laughs> you know, they, they want to give you the idea that what they're concerned about is babies, but they're not. What they're concerned about is women. That is why they hate abortion, you know, because it gives women too much freedom, you know. And so the, uh, that is their... That's what they're doing on the court. That's why, they, that's why the evangelicals supported Donald Trump. You know, it isn't because they've been waiting for this kind of whoremaster to come along. It is because he said, okay, you want to be against abortion? I'll be against abortion. You want to put this guy on the court? I'll put this guy on the court. And he did. Okay, one more person like that on the court, abortion's illegal in the United States. Okay, so that, and uh, when, I, when I was young, abortion was illegal. So, you know, I know what that is like, and I know what that's about, and that is their major concern. So, I, and Pence is from Indiana. Um, Indiana is one of the worst states in the country. I mean, I actually have a rating system in my mind for how good states are. <laughs> okay, I, you're never allowed to say that. You know, people are saying, oh, the states, we love the state. You know, <clears throat> I don't love all the states. And I would tell you that Indiana, is the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. It had the largest Klan membership when the Klan was the most descendant. Um, it is a Klan state. Um, and so uh, I'm not saying every person in Indiana, I'm sure there are people in Indiana who are not members of the Klan. I'll take your word for it, I'm not going there. Um, uh, but I really don't think someone like Pence could be elected. I really don't. You know, I mean, before he was the governor of Indiana, he was a right wing talk show host. I mean, Yes. What do you say to young women who say they're not feminists? What do I say to young women who say they're not feminists? You mean if they would say that to me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's the thing. I wish one thing that women, young or old, would understand. It doesn't matter what women say they are. It's not women who get to decide. You know, it's men who decide this. Until you understand that, you know, as a comparison, here's what I will tell you. Many years ago, I was speaking in a synagogue in, I think, Portland, Oregon. And I was introduced by the rabbi. I hate rabbis. I was introduced by the rabbi um, who was very concerned before he introduced me um, to uh, say that this, you know, some poll had just come out. And he and apparently all the other rabbis were very distraught because um, something like 50% of uh, American Jews were marrying Gentiles. They were marrying outside the Jewish religion. And he had this idea of how long it would take till there were no Jews left. Um, so that, um, and he was really upset about this. So then I came out. I was not supposed to be talking about, you know, the rabbi or Jews, but I said that the rabbi was completely wrong. Um, that, you know, it, and he was saying, what could this congregation do to prevent this? And I said, you know, here is the thing that the rabbi seems not to understand, among many other things, um, is that it's not Jews who decide who's a Jew. It's Gentiles who decide who's a Jew. If it was Jews who decided that, there would be no Holocaust. I mean, it's a ridiculous thing. If there's a Holocaust and you get to say who you are, I, everyone would be saying, no, not me. You know, so it's them. It's like, you know, Hitler had rules, the same kind of um, racial laws like they had in the South. In other words, you had one Jewish grandparent, you went. Okay, this is the same thing as like you had one black grandparent you were, or one black great-grandparent, you know, so that it's not women who get to decide whether or not they should be a feminist. So if you, you know, haven't decided, look around, listen to the men, watch what they're doing, you'll make a better decision. <laughs> you might even become a Jew. <laughs> yes. That's a very interesting question. Um, what do I do if I'm reading a bad book and I don't like it, do I finish it? This is something that happened to me as I got old. When I was young, I would, if I was reading a book and I didn't like it, I finished it. You know, at a certain age, I realized you don't have to do this. <laughs> if you don't like a book, stop reading it. If you don't like a movie, walk out. You don't have to finish everything on your plate. Life is not a jail sentence. 
So I would suggest, you know, if you don't like a book you're reading, stop reading it. Now, what I cannot do is I am absolutely constitutionally unable to throw a book away. I cannot throw a book away. I've never thrown one away in my life, even though many books come to my house unbidden every year. Um, we, we thought you might be interested. Would you like to give a call? But I can't throw one away. So if I can't give it away or sell it, I just keep it until a person I think is likely walks into my apartment and I say, you know, you would love this book. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, because you're not wasting time blowing up fruit, what are you actually reading? <laughs> what am I reading right now? Yeah. Well, say you were about to get on a plane for 16 hours <laughs> and you were very concerned, you know, that you might murder someone because you couldn't smoke on the plane um, or that you might, like, be getting off the plane in handcuffs. Um, I was like thinking, what should I bring to read on the plane? Well, I was thinking like, what books should I read to bring on the plane? Because you need more than one book for 16 hours. Um, and then a friend of mine said to me in this discussion, which I drove all my friends crazy for six months. I have to go to Australia, it's gonna be horrible, I'm never gonna be able to get through that flight. And so, in fact, I saw someone like a month ago and he said, how is Australia? I said, I didn't go yet. He said, how is that possible? You've been talking about it for... <laughs> So I hope I run into this guy when I get back. Um, but a friend of mine said to me, did you ever read The Power Broker by Robert Cower, which is about Robert Moses? And I said, I have not. He said, that's the book to take on the plane because it's great, it's riveting, and it's like 2,000 pages. Um, so I got the paperback version, which only weighs 25 pounds. This is never a book anyone would take on a plane. I mean, it's, it's, take, it's, like, it's in a suitcase. Then when people pick up the suitcases, I don't carry suitcases, but um, they go like, what's in here? And I say, a book. <laughs> um, it's a very good choice. Um, and it's a riveting book. And all of Robert Caro's books are great, including the you know, life of Lyndon Johnson in like four volumes. It's worth reading. The guy's fantastic. Not Lyndon Johnson, Robert Caro. <laughs> yes. Yes. Is there any, now that I have been here, um, is there any element of the Australian culture that I haven't seen before you mean other than in Australia? you have an affinity for? I'm sorry? you have an affinity for? That I haven't seen before? <laughs> that you like about us. That you like? Oh. <laughs> sorry. You know, truthfully, I'm having a wonderful time. The only bad thing is that it's never far from my mind is you have to go back. <laughs> and so even when I landed, you know, without coming off the plane in handcuffs, um, and I, you know, I didn't feel an incredible sense of accomplishment because the second I landed, I thought, you have to do this again. <laughs> and then I thought, who lives here? <laughs> and then I realized the people who live in Australia that most people think are Australians are just people who came from New York <laughs> and couldn't face that flight back. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>